welcome to the Executive Lounge with me, Inshira Addo. This is your business thought leadership program that brings you nuggets of insights from men and women who've scaled the daunting heights of starting their own businesses or managing institutions both here at home and around the world. My guest today is a woman who has broken and shattered the glass ceiling, but at a cost. And that realization has brought her to a point where today she empowers women around the world. Our very own, born and raised here in Ghana up until after her sixth form uh, education and national service, she spent the rest of the uh, best part of 30 years uh, living in the UK. Uh, she provides consultancy in uh, IT systems uh, for blue chips around the UK and Europe, and she also runs a sports event company, Gifty and Wright is our guest today and you're welcome to the executive Lab. thank you thanks for having me your story is very fascinating um first time i read the book uh, which you've just published uh, octopus on a treadmill the title grabbed me i thought okay octopus on a treadmill is the imagery uh you know was very difficult for me to capture the essence of the book mm. And then I read the blurb, and then I started diving into the book, and it was quite revelatory. Um, but in a nutshell, what is Octopus on a Threadmill about? Yeah, so Octopus on a Treadmill, what we're talking about, the imagery is the eight armed or eight tentacles of mm -hmm. the octopus, and it's representative of a woman and the many wheels that we spin mm. and the eight hour movement that we do you know you have your career you have your kids you have husband you have um your extended family to look after and at any one time you have several balls in the air that mm. you're juggling so the eight hour movement i thought was best captured with the octopus and then on the treadmill means we don't even have the luxury of doing that juggling while standing still we're literally doing that on the move. Wow, that's interesting. And, and it's a book that uh, talks about lots of things, but largely inspired by your own life story. Mm -hmm. um, so one time you happen to go see the doctor and the um, doctor decides to give you an interesting prescription and you're thinking, no, my life can't go down this path. Where did that light bulb moment come from? What was the inspiration to say at that point that, you know what, I'm going to go against the grain and start a new journey? Well, I had the option of staying on medication for, you know, another 15 years with all the incumbent side effects that came with it mm -hmm. um, and surgery as well. And, and I thought, okay, you know, at that time I thought I was in my prime and I didn't see that as the way I wanted to go and that was what led me to, s to think is there another option is there another way you know so conventional medicine is giving me this option um, is there another way to manage that and I mean I, I went to see a consultant with um, a spreadsheet of 14 symptoms that I had literally you know been tracking and um, I don't know about if you know about a medical system in the UK, but obviously healthcare is free, um, but then you're on a waiting list forever. So I opted to go private mm -hmm. just so I could get, you know, more time with a doctor and discuss the symptoms. And, and, and so, you know, I've gone and I've been given this and that, and I thought, hang on, you know, I, I'm still young, I'm in my prime. Um, I'm not going to live a life, you know, managed by pills and surgery no I didn't want that option so I so that was the moment where you decided that things are going to be different from now on yes what, yes what did you first do um, so it was complete change of lifestyle complete change of lifestyle so I have always eaten healthily to be fair but what I thought was healthy uh, was not quite good enough do you know because I didn't understand enough about food uh, so th there was that about changing the way I ate completely you know um, and basically going whole foods eating whole foods and cutting out all the processed foods um, as, as much as I could obviously it's impossible to cut out everything but as much as I could maybe say I always go by say the 80 20 rule mm -hmm. so 80% whole foods where I'm cooking myself and you know 
the rest, if it has to be processed, it has to be. So that was that, and I also went organic as well, because um, when I was growing up here in Ghana, you know, <laughs> everything was organic mm -hmm. then. So we had that, we just didn't know it, do you know? Um, and then when you travel, suddenly due to commercial pressures, then, you know, it's not so organic. Over the UK now, uh, to get organic stuff, you're paying a premium for that. So I pay for the organic groceries to be delivered because I know what is worth to me and my health. Mm. Uh, so, so that was on the physical side, as in, you know, changing what I ate uh, and the way I ate. Um, so the, the, there was that, and that helped to manage a lot of the symptoms, actually, because just by not eating well, your body, when you start feeling all those things, is your body's way of telling you that, you know, you need to stop and take care of yourself. And then it was looking after my sleep. A lot of people just you know I don't know they will burn the midnight oil because they think I'm being a high-flying executive and you know if I'm there in the office before everybody and I'm the last one to leave it means that you know um, I don't know hard or something uh, that's just stupid <laughs> that really is just stupid so you need to work smart rather than spending all your life chained to your desk that is not the way to do it and it's about managing your time and balancing um, your time as well um, so that when if you do that, and I mean the medical studies are showing you need eight to nine hours sleep, you know, and people don't realize how much sleep affects their systems and how it stresses you out as well and your memory and all that. And I was having memory issues. Um, so uh, by sorting the sleep out within two weeks, I felt different in my body and in myself just by sorting the sleep out and mm. making sure I got that minimum of um, eight hours every night. Um, and then exercise. Now, uh, to be fair, exercise for me was the hardest because I sort of had a moderately um, good diet and I'm also lactose intolerant so I wasn't eating lots of desserts so that took care of all lots of sugar and I went sugar free by the way as part of my diet as well. So. Um, because I was moderately sort of eating healthily, I didn't have a weight problem. Because I didn't have a weight problem, I thought, why bother exercise? I didn't understand the impact of exercise, especially for older women, on your bone density, on everything. Literally, exercise affects your sleep, it affects your digestion, and all these issues I was suffering with, I had no idea that exercise was also going to help. So by fixing what I ate, sleeping well, exercising I was managing the sort of things I could manage and get rid because when you do that you get rid of all the things that you don't need medication for mm -hmm. and then you know if you fix the lifestyle issues then when there's something seriously wrong that's when you need a doctor and then it allows them to do their jobs properly do you know rather than just I don't know medicating yourself just to uh, live so now in your case you found out that all of these um, were as a result of uh, pretty much just burning yourself out yeah let's look at um, interesting parallels. Um, uh, there's the mind um, or school of thought that in Ghana um, we peak late. Uh, so you're sort of leaving school at 27 um, and you want to climb the ladder, get into the middle class as quickly as possible, own a home, have a decent family, best education, go on holiday and these things take a long time mm -hmm. to have. Whereas you may be out of university and into a job by age 22, 23 if you're in the UK. There's a system that allows you to buy a car, pay overtime, get a mortgage, you know. So you're kind of easing to the middle class a lot easier there. Mm -hmm. But increasingly, we're finding people here are also working, you know, long hours, traveling long distances, spending a lot of time in traffic just to get to work. And it's all because we want to have decent middle class lives. But that almost cost you the very life that you wanted. Yeah, at what cost? So, um, and I wish when I was younger, somebody pulled me aside and said to me, these are the things you should focus on and the rest is just noise and extraneous. Uh, because I spent a lot of my life's energy chasing after things and of course I wanted the big house, the big car, you know, who doesn't? Um, and all that and you burn your life's energy chasing those things, not understanding the impact, the cost you're paying 
you know, for, for, for that lifestyle. And you think, and in my book I've got a chapter, you know, something about, you know, um, the ladder against the, the, the wrong wall or something. Mm -hmm. um, because you think, I've got my ladder against this wall, and uh, if I climb there, you get to the top and you find out that your ladder was leaning against the wrong wall. <laughs> and you need to move it. Um, and you will keep moving it because that is life until you realize that, you know, your values are not quite the right things. And, and the things, and then there's a research also in the book to show that the things that impact us most are our personal relationships in terms of, you know, the, the uh, our mental health mm. uh, also um, affects us. All those things come before income. But how much time do we spend, you know, investing in those close relationships? We would always prioritize our work, our career, before whatever our, how, uh, our wife or husband, you know, is saying. And it's because we have not structured our lives around the things that are going to sustain us and give us, you know, the, the life satisfaction. Because we think that if we ignore everybody and chase after the career, uh, and then we get the money, you know, our lives will be perfect. Whoa, I've got news for you. You will chase that career. You will get the money. The people close to you might not still be there waiting for you you might have lost your parents whatever do you know and, and then the money can't bring those people back and then the stress of doing those things in a balanced way also costs you your health so whatever money you got now you're going to use that to what pay prescription do you know so it's really is back to front the way so what's, what's the optimum balance um, in achieving pretty successful life yeah uh, and not at the great cost to self. Yes, and it, it, and this is where, when you say pretty successful life, this is where we need to define success and take it away from financial. It's only an element of it because yes, it's important, you need the money, uh, you need to be comfortable. So in my book, I go on about the uh, Maslow's Pyramid, you know, mm -hmm. so you start off with, the, with the, you know, your basic needs and stuff. Mm -hmm. And yes, those needs, you need to meet them because, you know, if you're starving, you, you cannot be thinking of anything else because mm -hmm. you're starving. So you can't ignore those needs, you need to meet them. But if you're starving, you need food, you need shelter. So you, you need to be out of the elements, you need shelter, but nobody needs a 10 bedroom house right so um it's knowing what is important and knowing that um you know my personal relationships are important so i'm always going to prioritize them yes sometimes the work has to come but only sometimes as long as you have this underlying thing that these are the important things to me you know i'm going to look after my families i'm going to look after my friendships you know um I, I, the career, yes, I'm going to go after my career. There's nothing wrong with that. Chase it, be ambitious, uh, but not at the cost of all these things. You know, you have to do, and this is where the balance comes in. Um, and then I'm going to look after my personal health because there is no point in, you know, having a 10 bedroom house when you're diabetic and whatever it is you're dealing with, do you know? Um, so it's, it's knowing what is important and, and your personal relationships, the things that give you your mental well-being. Um, and income comes, I think, a dismal third or fourth, actually, in the table. In the right? table, there's <laughs> only about five of yes. them. There's um, mental health yep. um, and then uh, relationships, yep. um, you know, and all of these. These are things that we typically nowadays take for granted yes. uh, and, and the reason I say we take for granted lately is that um, you find that in the UK for example and in the West um, isolation is the way of life everybody kind of lives in their own little box and they go to work and, and, and people see you at work and say how are you because it's a formality not because they want to know whether you really are fine or something is wrong with you um, and we're getting there over here as well because we're constantly on you know on this uh, uh, um, hamster wheel mm -hmm. uh, chasing success mm -hmm. and it's quite often represented by driving a, a, an SUV or a nice uh, luxury uh, saloon or, and living in a nice house. Yeah. What's the cost to the individual and the society if we continue down that path? Yeah. So if we're not, I mean, not knowing your neighbor, I think is a sin. <laughs> um, 
normally whenever we move into any new neighborhood we we always go around and introduce ourselves to neighbors what we do and we drag the kids with us and we introduce some some of them don't want to know it's their problem i am not going to live next to somebody that i don't know um, I'm lucky enough to, to live in a small hamlet where everybody knows everybody. And that was part of a draw for me because for me, I know the, the importance of personal relationships. And when my book came out, it was the neighbors really pushing it on Facebook and telling everybody about it. And that support makes you feel um, connected. And, and that connection leads to your emotional and, and mental well-being as well. Um, now, loneliness, I mean, the, the, there's research, and I, I mentioned this in my book as well, uh, research done in the US that shows that loneliness is 45% 40, more lethal than, than smoking. Wow. Yes. So, um, but again, we, we, don't, we underestimate these sort of social connections and the glue and, 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 and that sort of thing that makes us feel um, um, safe like today um, I, I know that um, you know I, I'm going back uh, tomorrow to the UK but the important things to me it's important for me to go home and spend time with my mother and sleep in the same house and and eat for food with my hand in there that is important that is connection you know um, and my mother's quite ugly you just never know when if you get the opportunity again so you need to embrace that and when i come back i immerse myself in everything i'm helping people you know um my, my friend i was staying with she was unbraiding her hair i was there helping with the unbraiding these create social connections and they make you feel connected they make you feel safe um and yes you need money yes you need the career but do not do it at the cost of you feeling self. Otherwise, you'd be stressed out. And I list all the issues, research about what causes stress and the effects of stress on women, on our bodies, the toll it takes. It can even affect fertility. So it is just not worth not living that balanced life. Interesting thoughts and uh, the cost of uh, chasing your dream. Mm, I mm, mean, mm, drive mm. is good. You say be ambitious. Mm. Drive is good, but mm. drive can also kill you. Yeah. Um, but how are you to tell mm. when drive is dangerous to your being? Yeah. When you're spending all your time on the road traveling on business, you hardly see your children, uh, you have smashed conversations with your husband or wife, um, and you start, you, you, there's this fallacy, you know, when you go on a business trip, people think it's all, um, uh, what is it, it's all glamorous and exciting. I was on a business trip to uh, Kuala Lumpur, and whilst we were there, we were there for two weeks, so whilst we were there, they had a Grand Prix in Singapore, so we decided to go to a Grand Prix in Singapore. I don't like Grand Prix, I don't, you know, a car is a car is a car to me, um, but the guys I was working with, they're into cars, and it, you have to go to a Grand Prix, so yes, all of us went to Singapore, and we sat there, and they started the whole thing, and it was very loud, my bones were shaking in my head, and I was sitting there thinking, I'm supposed to be enjoying myself here, I was not enjoying myself, I was keeping up with the Joneses. They were going and, and if somebody back home in England heard I was away on business in Kuala Lumpur and I went to Singapore and went to a Grand Prix, they think it's all glamorous. Now, as I was sitting there, was I enjoying it? No. My bones were rattling in my head. The, the, the motors were so... <laughs> the sound wow. was... So, do you know, I had the headsets on, whatever it is to block, it, and I still was not enjoying myself. Um, and then later on, we came back to the hotel and we had dinner. And for me, it was sitting around the dinner, the conversations and having a laugh. And, and that was more, you know, that was more enjoyable to me. And I, I, people are different, you know, and you have to know what, what is important to you and, and all that. But there's that fallacy of, of the business trip and, you know, living a glamorous life and it's got a big life. What does a business trip mean? You just see the insides of hotel rooms, really. You don't really, and you work, work, work. And have the time, you can go to some exotic location on business and you don't actually even see the place. You see the airport, the hotel room, and you come back. But we spend our life getting ourselves to that position where we can say, I've gone on a business trip. What is that about? Mm. Do you know? So the drive needs to be directed properly. Yes. Absolutely. Well, we're going to take a short break, and uh, when we come back, we'll learn more from my guest, Gifty and Wright, uh, publisher or author of the book Octopus on a Treadmill. Uh, very interesting conversations about women's health and the fact that women juggle lots of different things. But aspiration and your passion 
can lead you to great places, but it shouldn't be at the cost of the very life that you want to live. Stay tuned, we'll be back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me and Shira Addo and my guest, Gifty Enright. And uh, Gifty, just before we went off for the break, uh, we just talked about passion, drive, that it's a good thing, but it has to be directed properly. So we celebrate superwoman. Is it worth being a superwoman? So I say you can have it all, but you don't have to do it all. Mm. Um, and again, it depends on what having it all means to you. So, so long as you've defined what success means to you, and in your definition of success is not just money, and you've actually included the things that are really important, uh, and then you're prioritizing, then the bits that you can delegate, please, I'm begging you, delegate. You don't have to do everything yourself. Um, because there are people that will be better at other things than you, and you need to recognize your strengths and do where you, you, you're going to add the most value. Um, and then the things that, you know, you're not adding the most value and other people can do it, you, you need to delegate. Um, I was speaking to a woman in the UK before I came and she was saying, oh, I feel bad, you know, I really feel bad if I don't do everything myself. I feel like I'm failing if I'm not doing everything myself, you know, including, you know, cleaning her house all by herself and all that. And I, I, I thought, that is just crazy. You know, you're working a full-time job and, you know, you, after that you go home and your second job starts as well. You know, you have the kids and all that. You, 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 at least... At least you can delegate the cleaning to somebody else, do you know? I mean, if, if you're working all the hours got sent and you can't pay somebody to clean, what's that about? It's different, of course, if you enjoy cleaning and that is where your joie de vivre comes from. Mm. That is different. But if it's that, you will structure your life in a way that is around your joy of life. So um, it's knowing what is important to you and delegating as much as you can delegate and keeping the important things for you to do yourself um, and that is what generates you know the the, the y your essence i guess um, so back to the question can you have it all question is do you want it all do you want it all um, you can have what you want you have to be smart about what you want to make sure what you want is aligned to your goals um, Whenever I come to Ghana, my head is bursting with business opportunities and, and all I want to do. I want, do I really want to do all that? Have I, have I got the energy at this stage in my life? Is that what I want to do? Is that where I want to spend my life's energy? Is that where I'll make the most impact? What makes my heart sing is empowering women especially young women, letting them know that, you know, that they can achieve anything they put their minds to, so long as they're prepared to work hard, mm -hmm. and imbuing them with the confidence, right? So uh, that, that sort of mentorship, especially of young women, um, that fills my heart with joy, you know? And so if I can have that, I'm having it all. Do you know what I mean? So knowing what is important to you, channeling your passion into that, and please, delegate the bits that don't make your heart sick. But we live in a society where um, we see what other people are doing. We also want to emulate that. We yeah. want to have a big house. We want to go on trips, you know, take two, three holidays a year, go someplace exotic. We want to drive a nice car. We probably want to change that car every couple of years. Yeah. We want our children in the best of schools. We yeah. want financial independence, especially uh, looking at the fact that we have a culture that um, has suppressed the abilities and potential of the female, of the woman, for many centuries. And we're at this cusp of greatness, and you're saying that, well, you can have it all, but um, you can't have it all. Well, I'm saying you can, you can have it all, but the all should be what you want, rather than going after everything, because you can. The fact that you can have it doesn't mean you, you, you should, because it will cost you your health at some point it will cost you the, the balance and i think this is a very exciting time for women i'm really excited about this era the way very very exciting time for women um you know we're beginning to be recognized um and we're coming into our own in that we're becoming more articulate in um you know uh, and assertive you know in asking for what we want and and um you know you, 
now last International Women's Day, lots of programs, so people are becoming more informed about women, and I think we are a hugely untapped resource, hugely untapped resource. So, um, and I also understand the pressure, the financial pressure, and keeping up with the Joneses and what you need to do. You want your kids in good school, and who doesn't? Everybody wants the best for their children, um, and you want a nice lifestyle. Um, you can have a nice lifestyle, and you can have your kids in that school, but if you then, if you've made yourself ill, as a, you know, in the process of getting there, that's not success. So you can have it all, but if your all is badly defined, and if your all is costing you your health, you're not really having it all. So that is the point I'm making. I, I suppose I'm drawing a final line there. Yeah, that, that's definitely that's a very clear one too. Mm. So we've got all the balance in, in place. I mean, you've got work-life balance. You've yeah. got your work. You're able to now manage around ensuring you're not breaking your back at mm. work. You're getting mm. the right mm. amount of sleep. Mm. Um, what kind of cultural shift do we need to allow for more women to be far more productive and prolong their own lives mm. and quality of life mm. uh, while doing that. Yeah. So in the UK now, diversity and inclusion is a big deal, you know. Um, and in the boardrooms now, people are really being taken to task. You know, they have to print the statistics, how many of the board members are female, how many in senior leadership is female, and all that. And of course, the females have to be there and qualified to be included. So, it, 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 you know, you can put all the DNI jargon out there, but um, if the women aren't there, the women aren't pushing themselves there, they cannot take advantage of that. So, but for them to be out there, they must have looked after themselves, had their education, looked after themselves, and not held themselves back. So, um, when it comes to, and this is why I'm passionate about young women and what, you know, engaging them and mentoring, uh, because women are not like men. We're built differently. Physically and emotionally, we're different, really different beings. And in the workplace and corporate and all that, women, they want to tick every, you know, box. They want to dot every I, cross every T before they will even pipe up. Whereas a man is not afraid to learn on the job. They don't know anything that it's like, that's not stopping me. I am going to go for it. And then you learn on the job, you know, and, and so long as you prepare to learn, you can't, you can learn on the job. But women will hold ourselves back and mm, I don't think I'm qualified. Or even if somebody wants to consider them for promotion, then I'm, mm, I'm not sure. I don't think I'm ready. I, in my life, I'm not sure I've ever heard a man say I'm not ready. Um, but women, yes, we, we, we and, and so that's, that's a mindset that we need to change. That really is a mindset um, in the professional uh, place. Um, and then when you come to the domestic setting, mm -hmm. and I think this is where it gets tricky in the domestic setting, um, because depending on your partner and, and, and the situation you're in, you might have said the apple cart, you know, and, and, and that, can also affect your happiness, you know, because if your marriage is falling apart, um, assuming you're with the man you want to be with, then that is a lot of heartache. Um, that can then affect the children, and then it will impact your work. So it's finding, and I think men have a tough, tough job because they see women as very emotional beings, and, and not emotional, very complex beings, and we are very complex beings. Um, and it's hard for them to understand us, and it, it is incumbent on us women to educate the men in our lives. We need to acquire the, the tools, the communication tools, to be able to communicate our needs to the men to allow them to support us. And we don't do that, because what we normally we think, we, we <laughs> think the men should be psychic. So if they're not psychic, and they're not intuiting where we want them to be intuiting, then that's it, you know, we're going to have a fight and that's the end of the conversation. And it shouldn't be that. We should be able to ask for what we want. We should be able to articulate it. And, and I go into nonviolent communication in my book in terms of how you can ask for what you want and get it. And, and in the nonviolent communication, it works both in the workplace 
and at home because you know you have an observation and it's, it's how the observation makes you feel so if somebody's looked at you a certain way or whatever and it's how that makes you feel and out of that you know you know there's a need as in you don't you need not to feel like that and so then being able to ask whoever looked at you that way you know to say when you looked at me this way it made me feel this way i need to feel this way so would you please next time not do that do you know and it's just four steps and and um once you know that you can apply to anything you can apply to your husband you can apply to your children you know you can apply to anybody but you need to be able to ask for what you want rather than sitting there stewing away and not articulating what you want and it's not just for the men you know it's just general communication uh, and once you get you're able to um, ask for what you want it allows you to be assertive it allows people around you to support you because you're letting them know what they want without them being psychic mm. how should the rest of society align to make this you know good and better mm. and possible for everyone yeah so i I love being a woman. I mean, I've always been a woman. I haven't mm -hmm. been. A, I don't know anything right. else. Yes, I love being a woman, and I think, call it a sisterhood, call it whatever. Maybe because I went to a girls' school. I spent seven years of my life mm -hmm. with just girls, so I know how to connect to women. And the the huge support I've had in my life, you know, is been you know the, the sisterhood you know supporting me and people tend to have a negative you know connotation of women and things that can be catchy and all the rest of it, it women together are so supportive and, and, and they can uh, uh, push you on do you know so in terms of the change in, in construct and perhaps society we need to understand that women can form the, these bonds and support each other and there's a conversation you can have with your girlfriends and with other women that you can never have with a man they just don't get you know and, and we want to talk about things in infinite details and the men just just want to talk about in strategic terms and, and move on already and we don't want to do that we want to take our time over and a woman get that and women are also very intuitive do you know and we relate on a different level so um it's for women to understand the support we can give each other and, and society to come together to, to sort of form that support to support other women. I mean, in the corporate world, normally, if I see a younger woman, of course, because I, I feel I'm 105 years old, <laughs> but um, I'm always, for younger women, I'm always, even when they don't know it, I'm mentoring them. Do you know? Um, because I think, you know, I owe it to the rest of uh, younger women to, to pull them up to pull them up the ladder because the more of us there are up there the quicker we hit critical mass and rather than you being there fighting the battle on your own if you have a group with you and you hit the critical mass things go rather quickly than you know a lone ranger fighting the fight now the collective you know the critical mass you're getting the sisterhood yeah. you're talking amongst yourself um but it seems that the men still do need to participate yes um be it in the corporate world or at home and yes. social setting you've had the opportunity of straddling both the life of a high-flying executive in the corporate world yeah. and a high-flying entrepreneur yes. running your own business building it uh, from the ground up yeah are the challenges similar and and, and 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 the hurdles you need to get over are they similar no <laughs> so very different very different from working in the corporate world um and i i in the corporate world when people are waiting i'm thinking you, you don't even know how good you've got it uh because in the corporate world i think is more about and the bigger the organization uh, the, the more the politics and it's more about influencing people stroking people's egos uh, uh, and all that so it's more about your influencing and negotiation skills to align people and, and make sure somebody's on your side and we all know the big decisions are not made in the meeting you have to have the pre-meeting before the meeting and get all the decisions aligned so when you're going into the meeting it's just you know you've primed everybody just to agree to your point of view before you get into a big meeting um 
So that's a corporate world. Uh, in a corporate world, you have a marketing department, you have an IT department, you have a sales department. So, so, so normally, if I'm doing a program, um, so you know, implementing an IT program, you have all those people where they have somebody assigned to the program to help. So they're the experts in that field. Now, on the <laughs> business side, it's just you. You're fixing the printer, you're cleaning the fo floors, you're doing your marketing, if the IT, you know, computer not working, everybody's looking at you. So it's a different skill set and you have to do everything and or know somebody that can do everything, especially when you're starting out and you're small and you're pounding on doors for people to give you a break. You need the courage, you, don't, you can't lose heart. Um, and you have to be your own, you know, whatever, the cheerleader. Uh, you know, uh, uh, whereas in the corporate world, you start and, you know, you come up with a graduate program and they give you a mentor. Then you can keep going. Somebody's done it before. You don't have that here, starting your own business. I mean, I had no roadmap. I had to do all my research. I had to do everything. And I, I worked all the hours God sent. Um, I, I, and yes, and so sometimes when your life is out of balance, it's all right, so long as for a short while and as soon as you can get back the balance you bring it back because sometimes it would be out of whack and you know it's out of whack uh, when my book came out i mean that, that night i slept two hours normally i'm i'm the eight hour queen i did two hours because people everywhere email facebook whatever it was all going crazy um now I, I knew that but then i knew that as soon as i got the chance i would bring it back to even kill because I know what the baseline should be and you know 20% of the time you might not be hitting the baseline but so long as 80% of the time you're hitting the baseline you are doing fine so it's about keeping the main thing the main thing <laughs> that's the one right, all right. <laughs> we're gonna take another break and uh, when we come back we'll hit the back straight and uh, we'll learn some more from my guests Gifty and Wright stay tuned Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shirado and my guest Gifty and Wright. And uh, Gifty, the things you had to contend with in terms of the high octane um, work environment, juggling home, um, the children, the husband, social commitments, and things like that. If you would look at the UK and the, and the West, would you say that? We have it better over here? I don't think so. Mm. Why not? I don't think so. I, I think it's much of a much as it's just different, you know, in terms of different dresses. I, I, I think it's different. So um, maybe in the UK, maybe perhaps the, the men are forced to get a little bit more involved uh, in terms of um, helping around the home mm -hmm. uh, because most of the time, both parents are working so um, you, you just you can't just leave the woman to do everything you know um, but you also have the situation where women after having children decide not to go back to work because it's just too difficult and going back to work typically the woman's income uh, where you have to pay on childcare and going back to work is just not worth it, you know, financially. So they give up and they come sit at home, look after the children, and when the children are old enough, uh, they lost their confidence to go back to the workplace, uh, the skill set has changed, IT's moved on, and then, you know, so it's a whole lost contribution to the workplace. Um, so in that sense, that still happens in the UK mm -hmm. as well. Uh, in a way, perhaps it might be a bit easier here because you can have help, more help here perhaps is a bit cheaper I, I, I don't know um, so in that I think it's a bit easier for the women here to combine um, you know the, 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 the having it all as it were uh, because you can have help and you know you can have extended family helping out uh, so they don't it's changing now because my friends are here you know they're feeling the burn just like how we do mm -hmm. um but when they come over there we're always laughing at them you know what can you complain about you go driving you go gardening you go chef you, you know <laughs> whereas we have to do everything ourselves over there so um it's changing uh but it's usual with all these things yes you can have the garden it says but, but again that also comes with its own stresses as well and you even if you have those things have to manage those people as well so at least we don't have that stress of managing all those people but you have to manage that uh, if you're going to work on top of managing your work on top of 
coming to do the domestic. So I don't think it's easier. It's just different. It's, it's just different. How should society and, and more so the workplace, w w what needs to change in the workplace to promote uh, a better uh, life quality for women yeah and this is what contribute. I'm, yeah this is really what i'm excited about because i think this is where technology is enabling women to uh, really work in a more agile way um, um i knew of this lady who had a baby and she would start later so she used to start at about 10 uh, after doing the school drop off and then she'd leave at three to, to so she would do ten to three and then go home, look after the kids, kids go to bed at seven and then she will pick up and do another couple of hours in the evening. So it's that flexibility which allows you and now, you know, with technology you can do that. You know, you don't have to go to the office every day. You can have all your calls and I mean normally with the multinationals, you know, you'd be sitting in the UK, you're talking to somebody God knows where. So you don't have to be in the same physical location. Do you know? Um so where technology is changing, but what we need is senior managers that understand that agile working and to be able to give the women the flexibility so they can do that. Otherwise, the people that pay the price is actually, if you like, the, the corporate world because it's a huge talent pool of qualified women that just give up because it, it falls into a too difficult bracket, you know. Um, but that's how we can support them, you know, uh, providing crashes as well, that sort of thing. So helping them with childcare. Um, and, you know, for me, when my children were little, the thing that stressed me out most, if it was anything that was going to make me lose it, it was childcare. It was very problematic, you know, for me, childcare. Apart from the fact it's expensive and getting somebody reliable. And once I didn't have childcare, I'd be all over the place. You know, I couldn't bring my best self to work, do you know? So if they can be given that support where, you know, towards the childcare and that flexibility, so even if they want to do it themselves, is structured around the, um, the school working hours and it allows them to, you know, be in uh, the children's life. And I think for me, one of my regrets actually is working full time. You know, and, and I, if I had the opportunity uh, back then when the kids were young, uh, I would have worked part time. Uh, but financially, a lot of people can't swing that either. Do you know? Uh, so with the part time work, you, you, you're not, um, most working women are outsiders at the school gates, mm -hmm. you know, because the, you have the non working mothers and they're, they're, they know everything that's happening and people are telling you things about your kids you don't know. Uh, so you always have to be on the periphery you know um whereas if you can do the sort of a part-time thing maybe i don't know work three four days a week then you can sort of do be more involved you mm. know and, and not be so, so much of an outsider so if i had my time again do you know i think i, I would do that and, and and stay a little bit more um connected do you know um and it, it's just but workplaces are changing now i mean when i um one of the talks I did was to the BP International Women's Network. Mm. And um, it was just the same question, do I think younger women have got it easy coming up? And I don't think they got it easier, they just got it different. Um, so they have their own sets of challenges to, to, to cope with. Now the social media, for starters, you know, <laughs> we didn't have that to deal with. <laughs> um, so uh, th they have different challenges to face, but in terms of the battles of women being in the boardroom and the glass ceiling and all the rest of it, the glass ceiling hasn't gone away, but there are more heads butting against the glass ceiling and something is going to give mm. soon. I, I'm very happy about, you know, you mentioning the glass ceiling, yeah. you know, um, let's talk a little bit about the kind of support that mm. we can give at home. Yes. Um, and I'm saying we, uh, on behalf of all men yes. uh, who live with women, uh, who have to give the support. In your case, mm. how important was that support and how, did, how was it giving? It, it was crucial. It was pivotal. My husband is my rock. Um, and he was the one pushing me when I was there, mired in self-doubt as a woman I want to do. He would be the one coming at it with a typical male perspective, saying to me, you've done this, you've done this, you've done this, what have you got to doubt yourself about? And, and But that's what women do though, you know. So um, 
for the men and so this is a bit where it's tricky because sometimes if you're not careful we can make the men feel threatened and if that happens they're not going to support you and that is where we have to be careful so but if you're in the right partnership I see it as a business enterprise both of you are taking on the enterprise of life and you identify who is going to play what role, uh, which is aligned to your strengths, right? So, uh, and you have typical male and female roles, uh, but that doesn't have to be the case. It's what, I mean, to be honest, you know, um, writing about women, empowering women, people think, oh God, yeah, she, she wants to bash men and she's a feminist. No, I'm happy for doors to be opened for me. Knock yourself out, open those doors, but I want to come out and strut out as a confident woman that I am, mm -hmm. you know, without being patronized, um, because, I have earned my stripes, I think. It's taken me years to, to work through personal development to get to where I am. Um, and a confident man will not be, feel threatened by a confident woman. They will recognize you for what you are. They recognize the skill set you're bringing to the table. And if I had my way, I think women, when they go away to go have babies and stuff like that, when they come back to work, they should be given a pay rise. Because what they're coming back with is the negotiation skills of a UN peace negotiator. You know, because if you are negotiating between warring toddlers, mm -hmm. you, you, <laughs> it is well mean feet. So you come back with a whole set of interpersonal skills, which really is career enhancement. So um, <coughs> is that sort of, f for the men, please don't feel threatened. And for the women, find the ways of connecting and communicating to these men in your life because you can't turn them into your cheerleaders if you give them the chance. They would really, really push you on. Wonderful. It's been a fantastic uh, opportunity to have a chat with you, Gifty. And uh, we wish you all the best with your book. Thank you, Ishra. Thank you for having me. I really appreciate it. It's been a privilege. Wonderful. Five lessons I'm taking away from this conversation. Number one, that you define your level of success. What does success mean to you? Must it be financial? Should it be material? You must define what success will, it, it is going to look for you. Once you achieve that, it sets out the clear rules of engagement so you go after it in the optimal uh, approach as possible. Number two is that you should never stop being ambitious. Have big dreams. But don't forget that there's a cost to everything and that cost should not be far more than the achievement that you're looking for. The third thing is that find a good support group. Find people who will listen, people who will understand, people who will stretch your imagination, people who will be empathetic, people who above all will give you a pat on the back and say, you know what, it might be tough right now, but you're still on track. And the fourth thing is that you ought to prepare yourself for coming opportunities. Wherever you find yourself, the lessons to take away from those places and experiences, they all add up to make tomorrow possible. So if you're in a situation right now, remember you're on your way somewhere and there's a lesson from that moment you need for the next level. The final thing I'm taking away from this is that you are born and wired differently from the next person. So run your race. Don't keep up with the Joneses. Don't let someone's definition of success and their approach to it define how you run your life. Find the things that you're passionate about. Find the things that you're great at. Find the things that pull at your heartstrings. Find the things that bring you fulfillment and go after them with all the passion you can master. This has been another edition of the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Addo. Thank you to my crew and to the entire production team and our friends at Villa Monticello. I'll be back next week with some more. As always, go forward, make rain, shalom. The Executive Lounge.